it's 11 a.m. and um, I would say we we uh, we get going here. And um, it is my great pleasure to um, have Dr. Serena Kaur here for us um, from the UK, actually. So Friday evening, lovely Friday evening for her. Um, Serena got her PhD in chemistry at Trinity College in Dublin. Um, and she worked back then on magnetic nanostructured materials. Uh, in 2007, she started a postdoc with uh, Ram Sashadri at um, UC Santa Barbara, the greatest place on earth. Um, I, I, just <laughs> time there. I love it. it I'm, I'm biased. It's just for me, it's paradise. Um, so uh, this is actually, I think, where we, where we met, probably. Yes, um, it was. Our Santa Barbara connections, exactly. Um, she then moved on, moved back to Europe and um, started a leadership position at the University of Kent, then moved uh, to Scotland to uh, pick up a lecture position there at the University of Glasgow. That was in 2013. She was then um, fairly quickly, I would say, promoted to reader and then to professor and chair of energy materials. That was in 2018. And of course, her excellence did not stay unnoticed because she got another offer from another university. That was the University of Sheffield, where she moved to in 2018. And um, this is where she's at now. She's a professor and chair in functional nanomaterials. Um, at the University of Sheffield in the UK. And um, Serena works in the broad field of energy materials. And today she's going to talk to us about her research on battery materials. And I'm super excited, Serena, to have you. Thank you so much. And um, we look forward to your talk. Please, everybody, um, post your questions in the chat. And then if you're still around after Dr. Kors lecture, um, I will ask you to um, ask the questions yourself um, and then we can get a discussion going. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, and thank you to, to giving me the opportunity to spend some time with you. It's evening time here in Sheffield. That's why my lighting looks so um, sedate. Uh, but it's a really nice way to end the week, um, to meet up with old friends and to hopefully make some new ones. So I hope you can all hear me. If there's any problem with the sound, just drop a, a message into the text box and I'll, I'll see what I, can, what I can do. So this is a picture of my university, the University of Sheffield, um, where I'm a, a chair of functional nanomaterials between two departments, um, the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering and Material Science and Engineering. And I think that's a really nice sort of um, example of why, uh, how interdisciplinary the battery field is. So I get, I, I'm really, really lucky. I get to work between two departments filled with wonderful people. Um, and I wanted to just give you um, an overview of some of the things that people in my departments are doing, my faculty. So I'm at the Faculty of Engineering now. And people across um, departments in engineering are working on electrochemical devices for energy storage, um, looking at conversion, looking at uh, materials and modeling from power systems, grid scale stuff down to um, material molecule interactions and interfaces. We have people who are experts in synthesis from solid electrolytes, which I'm going to focus on today, electrodes to thermoelectrics, dielectrics, and really garnering control over morphology. Um, up as far as uh, manufacturing and processing. So being able to scale up and manufacture materials. And of course, look at the sort of techno-economic analyses and lifetime analysis of the materials that we're making. So my group in particular is the functional nanomaterials group. And um, my interests really lie across four main areas. Mainly, we are a synthetic group. We look at trying to develop strategic syntheses of functional materials. And that includes things like bulk materials, where we can start to understand the structure, the morphology, the, the, um, the interfacial behavior of bulk materials, down to um, more elaborate materials like porous uh, materials or nanostructured materials, where we might try to tune properties um, or behavior, uh, depending on what the eventual function would be. We have um, what I hope is a keen 
interest in structure, but it might be just that I really like going to synchrotrons. We use X-ray uh, diffraction, neutron diffraction, X-ray spectroscopic methods and total scattering methods to really try to unpick the structure of the materials that we make, because within that lies the, the key to getting them to, to do the things that you want them to do, their functionality, their properties. We do a lot of property measurements, depending on what it is that we're trying to achieve, whether that's electronic or ionic transport, whether we're interested in magnetic materials. And this is all sort of tied into the eventual functionality of these, uh, these materials. And so today's talk will really focus on energy storage, but I'm also very fortunate to work with people on biomedical engineering and, um, and imaging, as well as conservation tools for, uh, for archaeology. So I'll start with some synthesis and how we think about synthesis in our group and how we try to control things in a little bit of a way so that we can try to make materials that have morphologies or crystal structures that we really want to take advantage of. So we really think about our synthesis approaches because that route can dictate the final particle morphology or the structure of the material that you obtain. So my group has sort of primarily focused on the preparation and, and, um, and synthesis of nanostructured materials and trying to really uh, dive very deeply into their structure and their functional characterizations. We really like small things. Uh, and that's because you can open up new properties that perhaps are not available to you in bulk materials. But before we can consider the application of any material for its practical use, uh, we have to develop this understanding of the intimate interplay between the structure of our material, the property of our material, and the eventual function. And we use a wide range of techniques to be able to do that. And one of the ways in which we, we make materials is using traditional solid state ceramic methods, which do require very high temperatures, um, very long times. And that's because you're trying to overcome these lattice enthalpies and allow for solid state migration across an interface. And that requires a lot of energy. It also requires very careful consideration of the crystal chemistry. And you've got to think about phase diagrams so that when you're trying to predict the, the, the outcome of your a reaction, you stand a chance because you've really thought about the chemistry. And when you look at sort of electron microscopy images of materials that ar arise as a result of this sort of um, approach, you'll see that you get these lovely big bulky structures that you, know, you get beautiful uh, Bragg diffraction from. What if we want to tune that morphology um, a little bit? Well, one of the ways in which we, we do that is using solvothermal synthesis. And this is where we can manipulate potentially manipulate the shape, the size of our materials through either the uh, judicious choice of a solvent or some kind of capping agent that can trap a material as it, as it nucleates and grows uh, within that solvent. The nice thing about solvothermal methods um, is that it's all in a closed system. So you end up getting this nice headspace pressure that can drive reactions at lower temperatures that, that you may not otherwise be able to, to achieve. We've been combining this with microwave heating to try to speed up the, 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 the times of our reactions and also kind of try to reduce the temperature requirements as well. And what we find is that when we can do reactions very quickly in a microwave, we can sometimes avoid some of these deleterious side reactions that lead to a mixture of products or less control over the eventual morphology um, and sometimes if we get the conditions just right, we can tune the synthesis to provide single crystal materials um, of whether it's battery materials or, or materials for, um, for conservation. Why are we interested in that? Well, in the battery world, there, there's a growing interest in single, single crystal cathode materials because they may provide um, greater lifetime benefits as cathode materials and could potentially avoid some degradation pathways. I could show you a little bit of that later on. Another route that we, we go down is uh, co-precipitation. Um, and this allows us to really scale up an awful lot in terms of how much material we can make. The co-precipitation route involves a simultaneous occurrence of the nucleation of your sort of seed particles from 
a, a super saturated solution. You have the growth of those materials, the coarsening, the agglomeration, if that's what you're into. And you can try to try, you can try to tune the part, the final particle size and morphology. If you think about all of the different reaction conditions, like the pH maybe of your precipitating agent, the nature of your starting materials, if you're using metal salts, <coughs> the temperature at which you're doing this mixing, uh, how fast you're stirring everything. And so what I'm showing you here is um, a series of materials. They're the same, same type of material, this, this um, really hot material at the moment, lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt oxide, uh, where the ratio between the nickel, the manganese, and the cobalt is eight to one to one. So we, it's a bit of a mouthful. So we call it 811 for short. Um, and what we can do is we can tune how these um, primary particles start to aggregate together into secondary assemblies. And this is really important for trying to improve energy densities in batteries. And if we provide a little bit of our microwave heating, we can even fine tune facet growth in uh, primary particles and obtain single crystal um, NMC type materials as well. I mentioned that one of the parameters you can try to control is um, the, the choice of starting materials. And we have a, a, a keen interest in trying to, to, to work on that in a little bit and um, to try to come up with novel routes to nanostructured materials in particular. One of the ways in which we've been doing that recently has been looking at precursor materials where you can tune the chemistry of that precursor to contain within it the metals that you require for your end product. And what that can do is try to drive down any kind of um, diffusional energy demands that your starting materials may have. And again, that will help you to avoid side reactions and drive temperatures down and drive reaction times down. Now, the sorts of thing I'm showing you here are uh, the formation of these metal alkoxide materials um, where you can take a, a sodium tertiary butoxide and some metal bromide salt, whether it's, you know, in this case, iron or manganese. All of these are done under Schlenk conditions because these alkoxides contain these very labile metal oxygen bonds that break very easily so that when you hydrolyze the, the, the alkoxide, you get the corresponding oxide material. In this case, for the manganese, we end up getting this Hausmannite MN304, which can be used as an anode conversion material. Or we can combine it with a lithium salt and we can obtain the corresponding olivine structure, um, which is a very um, interesting class of materials used as cathodes in lithium ion batteries today. And the reason for that is if you have a look at that crystal structure, you've got in blue here these transition metal um, polyhedra and these one dimensional channels through which lithium ions can move during charge and discharge. There's a little bit of a difficulty with some of these materials sometimes in that what I've drawn you here is a perfect situation, right? A lovely Vesta image. But in real life, of course, you have defects. Atoms don't always go where you want them to go. And so you may have things like anti-site defects where a, 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 an iron ion in this case would sit in the position where lithium ought to be blocking that channel and not allowing you to use it for lithium ingress or egress anymore. What we found with microwave synthesis is we can actually avoid the formation of these types of defects. Um, and we find that we get very close to what's called the theoretical capacity for these materials, which is a measure of how much charge your battery can store. We're also looking at tuning precursor morphology one of the reasons we're quite keen on nanostructures is because when we think about battery materials um, and we want to think about high rate performance, so like increasing the power density, um, if we can reduce the particle size and increase the surface area, that allows for shorter ion diffusion path lengths when you're thinking about charging and discharging your battery. Also, when you have that increased surface area, there's more active sites for those lithium or sodium or whatever your active ion is to move in and out of that structure. Now I've mentioned power density there and energy density. So when we think about these terms, power density, you're thinking about the oomph, you know, the, the acceleration that you want to try to get. So very high, 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 high delivery of power. 
Whereas energy density is what you want to be able to do if you want to drive your car for quite a long journey. So if I was going to drive from here to Edinburgh, um, which is in Scotland, so I'm in the middle of England. And if I was going to drive to Scotland, I would want to have a car that ha had a battery with high energy density. And so I think this is quite a nice example because you can tune the particle morphology to either deliver you your high power densities or your high energy densities, not for every material, but for some. And in this case, we've made this sort of um, uh, porous lithium phosphate precursor, which, you know, just a very simple treatment with a, an iron salt or a cobalt salt affords lithium iron phosphate or lithium cobalt phosphate. But interestingly, we're able to maintain that porous morphology um, and that affords us that high surface area that we were after. And when we look at the battery cycling performance, that's what this graph down here is showing you. What we see is this is capacity. So the, 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 the milliamp hours per gram, this, this, this charge that's stored in our battery over cycle number, the, the discharge, theoretical discharge capacity for lithium iron phosphate is about 170 milliamp hours per gram. And what you see is that that, that is being almost reached for these materials. These little numbers, 0.1c, 1c, 3c, 6c, these are all telling you about the, the charging rates that we're, we're uh, testing those batteries at. So the bigger the number before the C, the faster your battery is charging. So if we're looking at a, a, a 1C battery, we're charging, discharging that battery over one hour. And um, 20C, 20 times over that hour. So we're really putting our battery under pressure when we, when we charge and discharge very quickly. But what you can see is you do lose capacity if you want to improve that, if you want to go to higher rates, but we're still getting appreciable capacity for even very high rates for these materials. We're moving to, to expand these kinds of precursors to try to make a precursor. In the last slide, I showed you one that just had the transition metal in it. Now we're thinking about making precursors where you have not just the transition metal that you want, but also the ion of interest for your battery in this case, uh, we're making some sodium uh, ion batteries. Um, we can also make this precursor with lithium in it. So I'm, it's, it's, it's a similar type of precursor with lithium in it. And I'm just showing you the crystal structure of it here. Where here's your lithium, oxygen, uh, sorry, iron, oxygen, lithium bonds. And again, you've got those labile metal oxygen bonds that can reduce your reaction times and temperatures because your species aren't trying to go around the reaction vessel, finding each other to react with each other. When we use this as a, a precursor for lithium iron phosphate, we see that we get, we, we actually reach the theoretical capacity for the material. Even at very, very high rates of 10C, we're still getting excellent capacity retention. And what we're finding when we look at sort of the, the characterization of these materials is that we're, we're seeing that we have very um, clean surfaces, very little uh, evidence for defects in these materials. And when we compare them to lithium iron phosphate that we make using a conventional synthetic route, they really outperform um, the, the, um, the conventional uh, routes that we would typically employ. So we are big fans of this combination of alkoxide precursors with um, microwave heat treatment steps. Okay, so we make all these materials. What do we do with them? How do we know that we, we have what we're telling you that we have? Well, we, we do an awful lot of analysis with diffraction. Um, and so if you imagine this lovely double perovskite structure, when we take an X-ray diffraction pattern of that, we get these beautiful Bragg reflections because this is a highly crystalline material. And so what, what that means is we are expecting this infinitely repeating crystal structure which gives rise to these beautiful Bragg reflections. And you can see from the SEM image here that yes, we have these lovely big chunky particles that, that give us these lovely Bragg peaks. What if you're making these nanostructures though, um, and you run out of space, okay? You, you've only got a very limited um, crystal structure because your, your particles might be only a couple of nanometers in diameter. So you don't have that long range order anymore. How, how do you assess those? If you try to do an X-ray diffraction pattern, you end up with these very, very broad peaks and all that information is sort of trapped in the base, in, sort of in the background. That's what I'm showing here for an alum, aluminium oxide nanosheets that one of our postdocs made um, as a sort of coating material or additive material for electro, solid electrolytes. 
Um, and we can see it's, it's you know, very, very thin material um, through uh, electron microscopy. So when we have materials like this where long range order is absent, we turn to uh, total scattering methods. So total scattering methods uh, provide us an opportunity to collect not just the bragged information, but also all of that diffuse scattering that's occurring because our material is deviating from what would be thought of as the average structure. So just to give you a sort of a picture of what that looks like, if you imagine that you're this atom here, you're standing in the center here, you look around yourself, you see that you've got these three nearest neighbors. When you look at the, the total scattering pattern, or we call the pair distribution function, you find that you get a peak corresponding to that nearest neighbor distance. And if you move out to the next nearest neighbor distance, you find that you have another peak corresponding. And if we move further and further and further out, what we end up doing is building up a picture in real space, this is in angstroms, of what our material looks like. And we end up with a weighted histogram of all those atom-atom distances that are making up our material. This is particularly interesting for battery materials because I mentioned these sorts of defects earlier where you have very naughty atoms sitting in the wrong place. It can be very difficult to assess those, th those when that happens um, through X-ray diffraction means, but by using tools like total scattering, whether it's sometimes X-ray total scattering or neutron total scattering, we can start to unveil these kinds of defects. Um, we can look at the population distribution of them and we can work out when we've developed a new synthetic method, are we avoiding those kinds of defects behavior and can we, try to, can we try to eliminate them completely and improve the performance of our battery cathode? This is just showing you the total scattering patterns for a series of olivine materials starting at lithium iron phosphate, going all the way up to lithium manganese phosphate, just increasing the amount of manganese at a time. And what you see is the, the orange line here is um, our fit, is our um, different, sorry, the, the blue dots are our data that we collect at the beam line. We've got a gray line over that, which is the fit to the data. And then down here, we've got this difference curve, which is telling you, giving you a visual of the difference between your data and, and the average structure fit to your data. Okay, so this is great. And I'm just showing you here like methods that we're using to just study these parent materials. What, what the, what's the big challenge then at the moment? Well, one of the challenges is um, that we'd like to be able to monitor product, the formation of products as a function of time. Um, now, whether that's the formation of materials in a battery or whether it's you know, coming up with a new synthetic method and wanting to evaluate what the, 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 the reaction mechanism or pathway is to that material, we'd like to be able to do that without having to stop, measure, and then put the reaction back on because every time we stop things, we, we give it a chance to relax and we may not be actually looking at what's going on in a, in a real sense, in a, in a real operating system. Um, and also that the, one of the challenges with that is, I've just drawn this little picture of you know, intensity versus time. This would look like one of my undergraduate lab reports where every point that I've collected for my for that I observe is is following the line that I'm expecting it to, and as many of us will know, that's unfortunately not the case most of the time. Things, uh, fun things happen, and so we need to have ways of being able to interrogate what's going on in a battery or in a reaction without disturbing it. So some of the tools that we've been using to do that include things like X-ray absorption spectroscopy, which is a very powerful method for interrogating redox active species in particular. Um, and so I'm showing you here the example of this nanostructured vanadate material called H2V308, which we can grow as these very, very long uh, nano, nano wires. And this can act as a cathode material, not just for lithium, but also for sodium. And we're also investigating it for magnesium. And it does that because uh, vanadium has the ability to undergo multiple redox, um, redox changes. And so that, that structure can, can host those lithium or those sodium ions during charge and discharge. I'm showing you here the beamline 
uh, B18 at the diamond light source. This is the beam line that we use for uh, a very fast collection of X-ray absorption spectroscopy data. And that allows us to monitor um, a real operating battery, which this photo is quite small, but there's a teeny tiny battery there, which has a little beryllium window that the X-rays can, uh, can, can penetrate and we can start to look at the changes in our material as we cycle. What I'm showing here are um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy uh, data that we've collected during charge and discharge. And what we see is that the, we, we can perform fitting to these XAFs data and we can monitor the changes in vanadium oxygen or vanadium vanadium bonds as the lithium is entering or deinserting from that material. Do you want to say hello to everybody? Yeah, I got bad You've got bad bones. You want to go into daddy uh, and mommy yeah. can give her a talk? Yeah. Okay, you go get daddy. Sorry. So, Operando X-ray absorption spectroscopy is a great way to monitor uh, local structural changes, but on a nearest neighbor basis. We're also using total scattering methods, as I've mentioned already, the pair distribution function technique and X-ray diffraction in combination with computed tomography. And this is a fantastic technique because it allows us to monitor um, spatial resolution of what's, what's inside our battery cells um, and we can do, we're, I'm just showing you some, these are not operando measurements, but I'm just showing you a, a nickel metal hydride battery where we're able to reconstruct diffraction patterns across every voxel in that image contains a, a diffraction information. And so we can pull out information about what, what is located where within our battery cell. And so we're able to pull out where the anode is, the cathode, where the separator might be. And we can even work out crystallographic information about um, how particles might be preferentially orientating within a cathode film. So the current challenges that we're interested in, in pursuing, uh, well, there's lots of them, but I just thought I'd show you four of them here. Um, one is looking at the interface of materials uh, within batteries. So, you know, when you have, um, you've got an anode and a cathode, I'll show you in a minute now how a battery operates, but when you have these electrodes, um, and you start to charge and discharge them, you can get the breakdown of materials at the surface. And what can happen is these evolve over time. We call that the solid electrolyte interface. And the nature of this is still not completely understood. And imagine if we could understand how that evolved and then we could try to control it so that we no longer get the breakdown of material at the surface. Um, and, but, but instead we could control it so that it would enable faster uh, ion migration across that interface. The other thing that we try to look at are the role of protective coatings. Um, here in orange, I'm just showing some cathode materials where sometimes when they're in um, uh, next to an, a, a liquid electrolyte, you can again get those reactions at the surface. You can get the breakdown of material. Um, you can imagine if you're constantly cycling your battery if you're thinking about the, the sheets of, of transition metal layers through, uh, through which those lithium ions are moving, constantly moving around to accommodate lithium, over time they can become stressed and they can start to crack. The introduction of protective coatings may mitigate some of those degradation processes. So these are, this is one of the things that we're looking at as well. In terms of new materials that are emerging, looking at uh, materials that contain that that possess a, a disorder in their structure, whether that's in the cation ordering or the, the anion ordering, and trying to understand the role of that disorder in allowing you to access materials that have, you know, extremely promising properties, but may not uh, deliver in terms of longevity. So how do you understand the role of disorder? And then how do you control it so that you can maintain high discharge capacities over a long time? And then the thing that I wanted to concentrate on today for the rest of my talk really was going to be on uh, mitigating things like lithium dendrite formation. So you may have been aware of things like the Samsung phone that would have been recalled a few years ago due to safety concerns with batteries. Um, these, are, these sorts of issues come down to the use of an organic electrolyte, which is flammable, toxic, um, and you know, you. It, if you're uh, going to use lithium metal as your anode, which you would really like to do because it's very light, it's very electropositive, 
you can end up getting the formation of these lithium dendrites, which are sort of like, you can think of them as like little bristles that are growing across from the anode, across that electrolyte, across your cathode. And of course that provides a route to short circuit and, um, and is a highly potentially flammable event. So all of these things benefit from the use of operando or in situ measurements. And I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to get to show you um, a method that we've been developing um, in uh, between the uh, ISIS neutron and muon facility and the University of Sheffield to try to assess ion um, diffusion in materials um, as an in situ method for looking at interfaces. But before I do that, I want to go through um, how do batteries actually function and then why we're interested in, in trying to um, al allow for the use of lithium metal, which would allow us to use solid electrolytes in all solid state batteries. So if you look at a typical coin cell here, this is a, a coin cell that would come out of the back of one of the a remote control. And if we highly simplify what's inside it, you have your negative end of your battery, which is your anode. You have your positive end of your battery, which is your cathode. And between these two, you have um, a separator to keep them apart and a liquid electrolyte that that separator is soaked in. And if we look at this sort of cathode in a little bit more detail, here again, I'm showing you another example of these NMC type cathodes. Um, and what I'm showing here is these lovely green ions here are the lithium ions that can travel in and, in and out from between those transition metal oxide um, uh, slabs. Um, and so what exactly is happening when you're charging and you're discharging your battery? So if we take a, a closer look, so during charge, this is the transition metal layer here uh, in blue. And then these green ions here um, are my lithium ions. And during charge, what happens is the positive electrode starts to give up some of these lithium ions. And these travel through the, uh, the electrolyte across to the negative um, electrode, which in this case is graphite. Now the job of the electrolyte is only to allow uh, ion movement. It, it, it has to be electronically insulating because those electrons are needed for whatever job the battery is supposed to be doing. So the, uh, the, the lithium ions are, uh, are moving through the electrolyte to the, an to the anode. And then when we're discharging, uh, the lithium ions are moving back through that electrolyte. Oops, I've gone the wrong way. Back through that electrolyte to the positive electrode. And that's producing the energy that's going to power our battery. Um, and so in both cases, uh, whether it's charge or discharge, the electrons are going to be flowing in the opposite direction to the ions around whatever external circuit that battery is connected to. Um, and the, the movement of ions through the electrolyte and the movement of electrons around some external circuit uh, are interconnected processes. So if one stops, the other can no longer go on. Um, so if, if, the, if, your, um, if your ions stop moving through the electrolyte because the battery is completely discharged, then electrons can no longer move through the external circuit. And so you lose your power. Okay, so uh, those lithium ions in this example are moving through this liquid electrolyte that's sort of sitting between our, our cathode and our anode. Why do we want to change that? Well, those organic polymer electrolytes, like I said, are flammable, toxic. And one of the things that's, that's quite interesting here is that it, they limit the voltage of the battery. So when you want to go to very high voltages, when you want to improve energy densities even more by moving to higher voltage cathodes, it's very difficult to do that because current um, commercial electrolytes, um, they can break down at very high or very low voltages. And of course, you know, the, the things in the news that you see of, of lithium ion batteries going on fire, this is a challenge now to try to replace um, these, these liquid electrolytes with something that could potentially be safer. And one of the things that people are looking at are these solid state electrolytes. Now, the advantage of these is that they have very high electrochemical stability. Uh, if you're using a solid as your electrolyte, you don't need to use a separator anymore. So that's one less thing to have to worry about when you're manufacturing batteries. And they can allow you potentially then to go to higher voltages in a safer way. What's the challenge with them? 
the challenge is you're trying to get two solid materials to meet and to marry, and they may not want to do that. So I had, um, I'm not sure if I still have this uh, yeah, on my desk. I did have a little piece of Lego uh, where I was going to show you. If you imagine having two pieces of Lego and you're trying to get uh, two pieces to meet, but they're not, they're not connecting properly, it's going to be very difficult to build something with that. Whereas if you can try to put something between those two solids, like a gel or a polymer or something that will allow that connection to happen, then you may permit the flow of ions across that interface. So really one of the biggest challenges in realizing solid electrolytes and all solid state batteries is trying to bring down those interfacial resistances and maintain good lithium ion conductivity across that interface or sodium ion conductivity, depending on, on, on your battery. So two strategies that I was gonna show you some examples of today were, and um, that we're trying to work on. One, because it's dear to my heart is nanostructuring. And that involves introducing a very thin coating of your solid electrolyte onto the surface of your electrode. And hopefully, by having that intimate sort of relationship between the cathode particles and your underlying, sorry, your underlying cathode particles and the surrounding electrolyte, it gives you more opportunities for lithium to travel between the two. And the other thing that I wanted to talk about was lattice, the potential for lattice matching, thinking about uh, complementary materials that might get on with each other. So if you look at something that may have a complex ion migration pathway um, between going from the cathode to the, uh, to the electrolyte, what you're building up there is a lot of interfacial resistance. And what we'd like to try to do is maybe think about materials where we can try to lattice match them at the interface, and that might provide more smooth pathways for lithium ions to move. So what, what do we do when we are um, trying to um, what, are, how, what are our sort of design protocols or do we have any? Well, we can think about um, these sorts of materials that contain very high amounts of lithium. I'm going to talk about lithium ion um, solid state batteries first. So if we want to make a lithium ion uh, electrolyte, maybe we should just pack an awful lot of lithium into that structure. Um, and what, what that can do is it could open up new lithium ion conduction pathways. Um, it may decrease the energy required for lithium diffusion to occur. Um, and it can also, because if you're putting something that's got a, a positive charge in there, you end up setting up some additional repulsions within your crystal structure, and perhaps that would increase the lithium dynamics. So is the answer to making a good solid electrolyte, just throw as much lithium in there as you can? Well, no, there's, there's a little more to it than that. If we look at an example, this is a very well-studied example, the garnet type solid electrolyte. Uh, there is a, a real challenge in trying to stabilize the, 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 the type of garnet phase that actually permits high ionic conductivity. And the, the, the phase that permits high ionic conductivity is this uh, cubic phase. If you pack uh, all, the, all the lithium in that you can, you end up getting this lower con ionic conductivity phase. Um, and that gives you very, very poor lithium diffusion properties. So one of the ways in which you can try to access this high ionic conducting cubic phase is to introduce some vacancies. And you might do that through some kind of selective dopant that you may put into that structure that will give you some of these vacancy positions that will open up a pathway through which lithium ions can move. And that's exactly what happens when you can take a little bit of that lithium out and put a little bit of aluminium in, you end up getting this lovely high ionic conducting garnet phase. And the lithium ions can move uh, either from these 24D tetrahedral sites into these 96H distorted octahedral sites. Now there's two of them shown here, only one of them can ever be um, occupied at the same time because they're very close together. And what you see, this is a, a lovely um, review by Wolfgang Ziers group in Germany, um, looking at the conductivity values for a range of garnet materials. 
the sweet spot for ionic conductivity that you want to be in is between six and seven uh, lithium ions per four milliunit. So we've been looking at developing, I've been talking about getting down to like lower reaction times and temperatures. We've been, traditionally, we would use ceramic methods which require white hot temperatures for several days to complete. By using microwave methods, we're able to drive those reaction uh, temperatures down to, okay, still a thousand degrees, but it's red hot. So you can actually look at it now. Um, and just an hour to, to uh, obtain multi-gram quantities of very high quality garnet materials. And we spend a long time, if you look at this uh, stoichiometry, it's quite long, um, but we spend an awful lot of time trying to assess that stoichiometry to ensure that we have what we think we have. Because uh, for a long time, because aluminium is very light, um, people were using uh, uh, alumina boats to make this material and they were getting doping of, uh, of their garnet by the alumina boat, without real, sometimes without realizing it, because you're not going to spot that aluminium in uh, your X-ray diffraction pattern. So we use a, a wide range of, of techniques from neutron powder diffraction to ICP to XAFs to really assess the crystal structure. We're also interested in assessing the, the diffusion properties. And when you look at the range of techniques that you can apply, to assess, this is just showing you the lithium uh, diffusion coefficient, um, what, to assess these, um, this, these kinds of properties, depending on the technique, you can span orders of magnitude in what you observe. So, you know, this is showing you some impedance results for everything in yellow here is for lithium iron phosphate, and that's spanning, you know, six orders of magnitude. Anything in blue here is the NMCs. So you can see for all of these materials, for, for these techniques, there, there are a wide range of, of, of values being reported. And same for uh, battery components as well, for cathodes, for anodes, for electrolytes. Mu SR, this technique here, you'll see there's a much narrower uh, distribution of values that you're, you're seeing. Um, and the reason for that is muons um, are providing you a local probe to assess diffusion properties in materials. And what happens is the muons, um, these are sp spin polarized positive muons that become embedded in your sample. They have a spin associated with them and they precess. And they live for about 2.4 microseconds within your sample. That's what this here is showing you. And after 2.4 microseconds, they die. It's a very sad reaction, very sad experiment. But when they die or decay, they emit a positron in the direction in which that spin was pointing at the moment of decay. Now you can imagine if you have a spin pointing in a particular direction and a lithium ion diffuses by, you end up perturbing that spin orientation. And so your, muon, your, your uh, positrons will be emitted in a different direction. And so we collect all of these positrons together. Um, we are able, this is what the, the raw data, these are what the raw data look like. Um, we can fit a dynamic function to these data, which contains within it a parameter that describes the lithium diffusion. And by looking at the crystal structure, we can work out the lithium diffusion coefficient, and we can work out the activation energy for, for ion diffusion within the material. And we've been able to show that for the garnets. I've told you how the, the, the lithium ions are moving through these garnet materials. By using muon spectroscopy, we can work out what the lithium diffusion coefficient is and also what the activation energy is. I'm going to skip through the next slide because I, I kind of want to get through um, two quick examples. So thinking about, um, now we, we know we can use muons to assess diffusion, thinking about these ways of engineering all solid state batteries. Here I'm showing you an example of nanostructuring at the surface. And we're starting with this lithium-2 sulfur cathode. So pre-lithiated pre cathode for a lithium sulfur battery. We're able to make this stuff using a microwave synthesis approach where we get these lovely nanostructured uh, particles. And we can take a solid electrolyte of lithium uh, PS4, um, which looks like this. And by just heating these together, we can end up getting um, our, our solid electrolyte material coating the surface of our Li2S cathode material. 
And we can we are able to detect this through a range of different um, different means. We can look at XPS, we can look at EDX, and we can see that all across this material, depending on the heating regime that we use, we can get this lovely thin layer of Li3PS4, this electrolyte material. We can make up these freestanding cathodes um, in combination with these uh, solid electrolytes, and we can use uh, lithium metal as, um, as our anode material. And what we see when we introduce this very, very thin layer of, lith of, um, of our solid electrolyte on the surface of our electrode, we get excellent rate performance, even at very high uh, current densities. Um, and the capacity we're able to maintain over many, many hundreds of cycles. So having those, um, that very thin coating of electrolyte is able to, um, to facilitate that fast lithium ion diffusion in these, these all solid state lithium sulfur batteries. I'm looking at the time and I'm realizing I've only got a couple of minutes left. So I'm, I'm sorry, I've sort of talked too much. I, what I'd like to show you is um, very quickly, is a new material, another material that we've been looking at, this NASACON type structure, lithium zirconium phosphate, which again presented a, a challenge because this type of material um, exhibits very complex polymorphism. And it's one type of polymorph, the alpha phase, which actually permits um, high ionic conductivities. And to be able to obtain that in a very dense form can be quite challenging. And by looking at sol gel methods, in combination with microwave chemistry, we've been able to obtain very dense pellets of this LZP type electrolyte, which shows very good total ionic conductivities. And then we thought about this lithium zirconium phosphate um, as an electrolyte. And by swapping out the zirconium for titanium, which is a, a redox active ion, we're able to deposit that lithium titanium phosphate as an anode material on the surface of our solid electrolyte here. What I'm showing here is just a, a colored EDX map where you can see this is where all the titanium is and there's zirconium phases down here. What we see with this electrolyte is when we put it in contact with lithium and we cycle it, we see that we get lovely stable cycling performance, which indicates a very stable interface. And we're able to build a solid state battery with these two materials, this, this zirconium electrolyte and titanium electrode, which gives us some discharge capacities of about 115 milliamp hours per gram for this battery. Now we've been developing methods. This is sort of looking at in situ methodologies for measuring lithium diffusion. We've built this in situ muon battery cell where we can now interrogate lithium diffusion properties at the interface in an all solid state battery. And these are just showing you the very first results from this battery that were just obtained a few weeks ago. Um, and we've, we've just submitted these for publication. So this is showing you this LZP electrolyte with this LTP cathode, and we cycle it uh, in, in the muon uh, beam line, and we're able to obtain that uh, muon fluctuation rate um, as we cycle the battery, as we go to lower and lower voltages. And what we see is that the diffusion rate of the lithium ions that's what this is showing here, is actually increasing as the battery is discharged up to a voltage of 1.2 volts. After that, when we go to lower voltages, we're damaging that electrode, electrolyte material by overcharging. And what we, we did want to see that because we'll see the resulting um, response in that muon fluctuation rate response, which is what we see here. And we start to see that you, you, you're starting to damage that electrolyte. And this, is, this was our sort of first uh, ex exploration into uh, in situ battery muon measurements. And we're currently optimizing this for, for interfacial behavior. I think I may, may have, did, did you think I have one more minute left, Christina? Cool, okay. The last thing I'll tell you about then are these uh, new family of compounds that we've, we've been working on for some time now, these perovskite structures. Um, so perovskite's fantastic because you've got this really rich playground within which you can start to think about different cations and different anions in your structure. And if you choose carefully, you could potentially think about an anode or an electrode material where your, uh, your, your, your B site cation could be redox active and allow for 
um, redox active behavior. So you can you can undergo those changes when the lithium is inserting and deinserting into the, the structure, or you could judiciously choose that cation so that you can obtain a, an electro an electrolyte material. And so we've been able to make this uh, lithium lanthanum uh, metal oxide material where the stoichiometry confers an A-site uh, deficiency, as well as um, an additional uh, 0.5 lithium ions per formula unit compared to what the prototypical um, double perovskite family looks like, like this lithium lanthanum metal oxide. We've, it, we, we did this uh, using tungsten as our potential redox active cation and using tellurium, which shouldn't be redox active. And we can make both materials, which have very similar crystal structures. We're able to look at the uh, stability of that uh, tellurium phase, which is our solid electrolyte phase. And we see that even if we go to quite high um, charging rates, we get this lovely stable um, interface between our solid electrolyte and our lithium metal. So we're, we're, we're confident that this is, uh, has excellent compat compatibility with lithium metal. But when we, ask, when we treat these pellets, when we take this, this powder, we press it together using spark plasma sintering, we see ionic conductivities on the range of 0.12 millisiemens per centimeter, which is really excellent for a solid electrolyte. We're also able to interrogate the ion diffusion in these materials using impedance spectroscopy and using muon spin re uh, relaxation spectroscopy. And we see very good um, values for our activation energies for lithium diffusion. We've, the last thing I'll tell you about, we, we've been able to build um, an all solid state battery with these now, because the reason we wanted to look at these was thinking about that idea of lattice matching across an interface. And what we can see when we cycle this, uh, this this tungsten phase um, as an anode material, we get quite high discharge capacities of around 125 milliamp hours per gram. We're also able to make the mixed tungsten tellurium phase. So we can start to think about perhaps growing a solid solution across that interface. And when we look at the uh, combination of lithium metal with our tungsten active material and our tellurium solid state material, we can see a clear redox response in our um, quasi-solid state electro, uh, solid state cell. I'm saying it's a quasi-solid state cell because we have added a very tiny amount of ionic liquid into that um, just as our sort of proof of concept. But this is work that's sort of ongoing in our group at the moment. So with that, I, I, I just want to, I should skip to the end um, and just acknowledge all the people that do the work, um, I'm very fortunate to have a really fantastic group of researchers. Uh, in particular, just to point out um, uh, Hani El Shanawi, who's been doing all of the work on, on solid electrolytes, as well as Innes McClelland, who's a PhD student in my group, uh, Sam Booth, who's an expert in uh, X ray absorption spectroscopy, um, Beth Johnston, who's been doing an awful lot of work on making these sort of precursor materials. Um, but really everybody, all the postdocs, all the PhD students, my collaborators, I think I should really mention in particular, uh, Eddie Cusson, who's here, he's my favorite collaborator. I also happen to be married to him. Um, but uh, it's really, uh, he's the first person who got me into solid state electrolytes. I'd like to thank all, all my collaborators at the FutureCat project, um, which is part of the UK's Faraday Institution for Battery Research. Um, I lead this program with about uh, 50 researchers looking at next generation cathode materials um, and just to, to, to say thank you to them for, for all of their, their support um, as well as the funders. And if there's questions, I'm very happy to answer them. And if I've kind of gone slightly over time, I'll, if you want to email me, I'll, I'd be very happy to, to respond to any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Serena. Beautiful talk, and I love how a lot of solid state chemistry and structure considerations play into um, these devices. And um, yeah, it was beautiful. I liked all of your slides and all of the graphs. So oh, thank you. Ram, Ram, well. Ram, Ram taught you very well, and he would be very proud. <laughs> he is very proud, I'm sure. So um, yeah, I have a lot of questions, but um, I would like to um, go into the chat and let yep. us go first, because I know that um, Donald had um, some questions. So please, Donald, if you wouldn't mind, ask them 
yourself, that would be great. If he's still here. Yeah, he's well, I can, I can see the question in the chat. So the, the question here is that uh, the world needs long range electric transportation. How does your technology achieve or help with this need? Are you working with the EV market? And um, basically, you know, how are we interacting with industry to mm -hmm. make sure that what we're doing in the lab is, is actually answering the key mm -hmm. questions that industry might have? Thank so, you. Sorry, I thought you might be gone. So. I was on mute. I couldn't figure out how to knock the button off. So, <laughs> so, so the answer to that question is, is a very big yes. Um, I, we are working with very closely with industry partners. Um, part of the, the remit of the, the Faraday Institution project in the UK is to ensure that there's very close interactions between um, academic research groups and key industry partners across the battery supply chain. And so we are working with, um, with, with materials manufacturers who are making cathode materials. We're speaking to uh, car manufacturers who are looking at uh, performance gains for electric vehicles to try to understand exactly what their needs are so that when we're trying to engineer materials, we're doing it in a way that it's actually going to make a difference to industry. So in particular, things like improving the range of electric vehicles, improving those energy densities. I didn't get a chance to speak about it today, but looking at things like the cathode, which is one of the most expensive parts of the battery, trying to reduce the cost there, whether it's by eliminating some of the more costly transition metals like cobalt, for example, or whether it's trying to come up with uh, faster routes to manufacture that, that are actually that's, that, that fit in with current manufacturing pro, um, processes. Um, so we are, we are very much working closely with the EV market. In terms of um, transmission on power lines and, and sort of thinking about sort of larger scale storage challenges, um, the, the sorts of things that I'm keen to work and that, that I am working on are, are things like uh, sodium ion battery technologies where, you know, the... You, you may end up um, not quite reaching um, the same voltages as some current lithium ion batteries, although there is, there's a huge amount of work being done at the moment, but where you might end up coming up with materials that could potentially be used for, um, for large scale energy storage. I think you've, you've made an excellent point in terms of power losses. And I think one of the big areas that I, I, well, I hope one of the big areas that we'll see sort of developing in the next few years will be when you have these batteries and this, this method for energy storage, and you're trying to marry it with um, renewable energy uh, resources, whether it's wind or solar or tidal, the minute you start to put all of these devices together, you're just, you're introducing another interface, right? So you're introducing another way to, another lossy thing in your system. And I think there's an awful lot to be done in terms of uh, coming up with integrated energy storage and conversion, whether it, that's through smart manufacturing or whether it's through learning from, say, nature and how nature does things in very confined spaces where we might be able to be able to harvest, say, solar power um, and then con convert that and store it into chemical energy in a battery. But I, I think I've given a very long answer to your question. I hope I've covered it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. It, it's worth it's worth having a virtual beer over. That would be brilliant. <laughs> Christina will tell you I'm always up for a virtual beer. <laughs> and real beers. And real beer. <laughs> any, any beer. Any beers. Any beers. There's an, another question on in situ mu on how do you distinguish between lithium diffusion and the electrode versus the solid electrolyte? That's a fantastic question. So you you can um you can work out mathematically the stopping distance of the muons in the battery cell. And so that's why when we're commissioning these cells, we do an awful sure that the, the, the muons are actually stopping in the site that we want them to stop in. And so our first set of experiments that we did were trying to measure the, the lithium diffusion within the electrode and then within the electrolyte and then at the interface. Um, and so that does take an awful lot of tweaking, uh, but it is possible to do. So, um, so it, that is a really good question because I think one of the, the, the nice things about these muon experiments will be probing diffusion processes at the interface, which is 
traditionally very difficult to do. There's an, are you okay with me just reading these out, Christina? Yeah, yeah, you're fine, you're fine. Go um, for it. So um, with so many promising and advancing materials, how long, how, how does it work when, the, when taking these to industry? Um, will battery will manufacturers adopt new battery technologies or will it take them a long time to change? So again, another great question. The, the interesting thing about this is that the, the sort of technology uh, decisions or the, the sorts of technologies that we're developing today will be, you know, it's going to take 20 years before they, they reach mass market. So the sorts of decisions we're making on technologies today are going to hopefully herald this, this dawn of electrification in, in, in 10, 20 years time. And I think that that sort of goes back to the, the question from Don about, you know, are you actually speaking to the electric vehicle market? Because if we're not speaking to industry partners, then we could be sort of going off and, and making some cool materials. And, you know, we're solid state chemists and material scientists. So, you know, we love making stuff and understanding it, but ultimately we want to be able to see these materials be, get, get some sort of commercial uptake. When it comes to the solid state materials, they are slightly trickier. Um, so when, when we're doing work on advancing cathodes, for example, we do try to, um, to, to work on chemistries that could to kind of drop into current manufacturing processes. When you're looking at solid state electrolytes, there is a challenge there in manufacturing those batteries at scale. Uh, but that is an ongoing challenge. Um, there are electric vehicle manufacturers who are very keen on these. Um, so I think there is a buy-in. And, and because you have that safety aspect as well, I think you know, there's a huge opportunity there for solid state materials, I think, for, for all solid state batteries. OK, um, the next question was on densification of the solid electrolyte to maximize volumetric energy. So densification is really tricky. If you have sort of big clunky pores between your grains and your solid electrolyte, all you're doing is introducing more difficulties for your ions to try to move around. And so we do a lot of work on um, trying to come up with clever synthetic tricks to maximize how uh, compressed our materials can get. So. One of the things that we, we employ a lot are things like sol gel chemistry, where we can control the particle sort of, um, we, can, we can make smaller particles and smaller grains that we can then compress a lot easier. And so that lithium zirconium phosphate that I showed you earlier, that's um, cold pressed and highly, highly sintered. So we didn't need to use anything fancy like spark plasma sintering to be able to obtain really good conductivity properties for that material. We, we are using some spark plasma sintering. That's where you can get highly dense pellets of material. Um, so very few pores. But I think there's an enormous amount to be done in terms of controlling primary particle morphology so that you get that really good packing when you're trying to press the materials together. Um, What's your opinion about sodium and magnesium batteries given they're more abundant and less dependent on lithium supply chains? Yes, so my view is that um, I think that there's no one size fits all. I think that whatever we have in the future will be highly hybridized. Um, I, I think batteries have a role to play. I think so do, so do fuel cells, hydrogen, tidal, every, you know, I think that the, there's there's a, there's a space for many for many things in 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 the future, in terms of sodium and magnesium, they still have uh, considerable challenges to overcome. But I, I believe certainly in the case of sodium that will happen, and um, because there's a there's a lot of really great researchers around the world uh, discovering new kinds of cathode materials, for example, in in sodium ion batteries, which are elevating energy densities into the lithium battery realm. Um, so I think for, for sodium, you'll see, you know, continuing um, performance enhancements in terms of energy density, but I think also in terms of large scale storage, sodium, I think for me, sodium and, and sort of um, flow batteries, I think, have a, a, are showing huge promise. Magnesium, a little trickier. So magnesium, um, it's a bit more difficult to find electrolytes that are compatible 
that aren't very corrosive. Um, magnesium metal for stripping and plating is very difficult to control. And there, there isn't the same sort of plethora of candidate cathodes for magnesium ion batteries. So it's, it's one of these areas where I think we need to do an awful lot of research to discover new materials that could enable magnesium ion batteries. Um, but the, the, the promise of them is great because, you know, for every one magnesium, you could potentially be getting two electrons. Candice had, has a question about uh, the perovskite solid state battery. Um, can it be fabricated using conventional sintering or SPS also needed? It can, yes, yes, we can fabricate it using uh, conventional just cold pressing or, or, or hot pressing. We don't need SPS, but we get better conductivity value, ion, ion conductivity values if we, if we use SPS. I think one of the things that would be really interesting to look at for that material Again, we'll be trying to control the grain size when we're, we're making it. Um, and if we can come up with, well, we are trying to come up with new ways of making that material. So when we, if we can get the grain size to, if we, if we, can, if we can make suitable grain sizes where the, part, the, the powder pressing is more amenable and we don't have to use spark plasma sintering, it would be great not to have to rely on that technique because it can be very challenging to get SPS to work properly. Um, and I think you asked as well about any deleterious side reactions, cat cation into diffusion at the cathode solid electrolyte interface in that example. Um, so we, we've only um, looked at the anode plus the electrolyte plus lithium metal. So we've not paired it with like a, an 811 cathode yet. I think that's going to be a really interesting experiment to try because um, with these sorts of transition metal electrodes, these, these cathodes, you can get transition metal dissolution. And I wonder if having that solid electrolyte in play may avoid some of that. So this is sort of work that's still in progress. And I'm quite keen to look at, you know, growing solid solutions across that interfacial layer to see if that facilitates better uh, lithium ion diffusion. I think I have one more question. I'm so sorry, sorry Christina, should sorry. I stop talking? No, no, no. Can I jump in here quickly just because you mentioned SPS and I had a question about that too, if I may. Um, because of the current that goes through the sample, um, is do you see any drag of ions that this current might lead to in, and then you get some sort of you know, gradient in your, in your um, final material after the process? We, we don't, and we, and we look for it um, okay. because uh, we, we do an awful lot of sort of electron microscopy EDX type yeah. mapping to make sure that we, we don't get that. Yeah. Um, but having, you know, we don't because uh, ourselves and our collaborators do a huge amount to optimize the, the SPS conditions. Okay. And it really does take a long time to get them right. Yeah. Um, but but I imagine that you could, if your material was a little less robust, I imagine that you could see um, sort of, uh, yeah, these sorts of concentration gradients across yeah. a single pellet. Yeah, okay. I mean, you could technically use like a, a insulation layer um, so that the current does not go through your sample, but I'm not sure if you can completely prevent it. That's, yeah. uh, that's the thing. Okay, thanks. And you, you may keep going. <laughs> okay, I think I've got one, one last question yeah. and then I can feed the kids. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Thanks for being so understanding when my uh, four-year-old walked in. That was, that was oh, very no kind need of to, you. No need to mention that at all, Serena. <laughs> so uh, when you are currently evaluating the performance of your materials at higher voltages, do you see significant changes in the interfaces with high voltage? And the answer to that question is absolutely, yes, 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 we do. So we... We are not operate, we're operating up around, you know, pushing to 4.6 volts um, because going any higher than that, you run enormous risks of, this is for or, uh, organic electrolytes, you run enormous risks of, of, um, of flammability. We do uh, do high voltage um, polarization tests to assess whether or not our solid electrolytes are stable against lithium metal. Um, and so far, so the things we're looking for when we do that is, are we getting lithium dendrite formation? Just because it's a solid doesn't mean that a dendrite can't grow in between the grains and permeate through the solid electrolyte. 
Um, so one of the things we do as soon as we've done a high voltage test is look to see for signs of uh, lithium dendrite formation. And, and, and you'll see that in these polarization tests, you see signatures of that. And of course you can, you can um, do a post-mortem on your battery and, and have a look to see what's happening at the interface. And so we do lots of things like um, XPS to try to understand any interfacial reactions that are happening. Sometimes they can be beneficial. So in the case of LZP, um, there is a, a, a benefit to having uh, interfacial reactions there because the interface that actually forms still permits the diffusion of lithium and sort of protects that surface. Um, but in other cases, you may not be so lucky and you may end up actually reacting with your, elect with, with your electrolyte. So uh, it, it's very material dependent. Uh, Dimitri asked that question, it's very, very material dependent. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Serena, again, for great talk, answering all of the questions and um, sticking with us. I know this is this is family time, so I don't want to keep you. It's the weekend time. now. Yeah, yeah. You all, you so, guys all have to go back to work. I'm, I'm going to have a glass of wine. <laughs> we will go back to work. You enjoy your glass of wine and uh, have a great weekend. And, well, thank um, you so, so much for having me. It's, it's such a pleasure. I've had a really nice time. Uh, it's a you. lovely way to, to finish the week. And it's yeah. great to see you too, Christina. Yeah, thanks, great thanks, to see thanks, you. Irina. Thanks, and Thank and you. Either. Thank you for everybody who came on and came online uh, for your for this talk. We had about 70 people, around 70 people online um, at yeah. some point uh, for most of your um, this hour. And um, so this, I think, shows the broad interest in, in yeah. these types of materials. So thank you so much. You're welcome. I can't wait to visit in person. Yes, yeah. we can't we can wait to have you. I just wanted to add that it's plus one, Christina, because of the four-year-old. And yes, that, of so far, we've had the youngest viewer so far, right? Yep. Uh, yep. For, yep. for all our time. So. For sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> we have a local audience. <laughs> great. Well, have a great uh, rest of your day. So okay. Are you going to uh, ship the polos to UK, all the way to UK? All right. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. We, we are. We made... are. Yeah, I, I think it may... is online. Uh, yeah. Sorry, sir. Christina. Yeah, go ahead, Krishna. You can explain. No, I was going to say, Serena, please uh, send uh, uh, us or uh, Christina your mailing address. We want to forward the uh, a polo that we made specially for this. Uh, but I'm, I'm I'm going to take care of it either today or tomorrow. Wait, really? Yeah, but we've been so lazy. I, I've I rarely go to work anymore. So <laughs> I live I want... in this room. <laughs> the, the idea was for us to mail the the polos prior to the talk but i've i have done nothing like every week i, I repeat the same yeah i'm going to take care of it this week but i never do it but well I'm that is so sweet i wasn't expecting anything that's cool i'll wear it with pride <laughs> it will happen eventually right <laughs> yes okay yeah. thanks a lot, guys all right okay. Have Thanks a nice so day. much. Bye. Bye, Serena. Bye. Bye, Bye. all. See you. Bye. See you.